Welcome to Top Advisor Marketing, where you will learn how to become a prolific online influencer, attract more ideal clients, and grow your practice. Brought to you by Top Advisor Podcasting, a done-for-you podcasting solution built just for trusted advisors. And now, your co-hosts of Top Advisor Marketing, Kirk Lowe and Matt Halloran. Hello and welcome to episode number 63. Today we have a very, very special guest, Jay Moreland, who is the founder of the Emotional Investor and the Behavioral Finance Network, and he is a behavioral coach. This is a fascinating human being that we're going to have the opportunity to pick his brain a little bit because so many of you talk about behavioral finance and just overall behavioral stuff that's going on with your clients, and we have the expert of all experts on the podcast today. So, Jay, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. I, I don't know about expert of all experts. Uh, I will <laughs> humbly accept that and hope I can live up to that on the uh, podcast. Well, I've already I've already engaged with you on some of these things, so uh, I, I definitely think that you're going to add amazing value to the show. But I want to find out about how this happened. So we're going to do a little bit of a backstory on you and find out how you went from being, because you're a financial advisor, you're a CFP. How did you transition into this expertise of being a behavioral coach and emotional behavior with investors? I'll tell you this. It's by absolute pure accident. Never did I ever think that taking one step upon another would would ever bring me to this point. But a little bit of backstory. So I started with Morgan Stanley back in 99. I did three weeks training at Two World Trade Center and uh, was there for a few years, got recruited. I was on a team, got recruited to Merrill. And I was with Merrill until two weeks before Merrill was bought by B of A. I resigned and went independent. And what really got the ball rolling here, and it was actually really important that I was independent at the time, is with the whole financial crisis, I got really frustrated by all of the experts out there, right? The ones that give us the predictions that, that you know, they earn, you know, seven figure incomes, maybe higher. Mm-hmm. And we rely on them to tell us, you know, give us ideas of what's going on. And mainstream Wall Street missed it. You know, all the normal people that we listen to, no one predicted the biggest financial event since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm like, well, what good are these people? You know, nobody cares if the market goes down five or 10 percent. We care about the big events. And yet they showed a complete inability to predict or even talk about something like that. And, you know, I realized that Wall Street and whether they're an economist, an analyst, or even the Fed has to be positively biased. I mean, can you imagine if Ben Bernanke, back when Bear went under, when Bear Stearns went under and people were starting to kind of question it and everybody said, oh, don't worry, this is a Bear Stearns issue. Can you imagine if Bernanke came out in a press conference and said, you know what, guys, this is just the very beginning of something very bad right? It, it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy at mm-hmm. that point. So what I did was I realized, all right, they're going to be optimistically biased. Nobody's going to be able to tell us or predict, even if they really think it's going to happen, because they may be out of a job tomorrow if they do that. So I decided to go back to school, get a master's degree in economics, because I wanted to learn how to model this stuff myself so I could create my own unbiased opinion, knowing that I don't answer to an investment bank, nor do I answer to an asset management firm, nor can I move the markets. And when I went back, got a master's degree in uh, applied economics from the University of Minnesota, what I learned, number one, is why these forecasts and predictions are often wrong. And that is really because they assume that the investor is rational. And so that whole concept of investor rationality was very interesting to me, especially when we define what investor rationality is. And that is that an investor that's rational is one that makes no mistakes and is not influenced by emotions. So basically, it's a computer program. It's an algorithm. It's certainly not a human being. So I did my thesis on this topic, and that really got me into behavioral economics, the Kahneman Tversky, Ariely. I mean, you can go on and on with the people that are in that field. And I realized, wow, this is very interesting stuff. This science has been out for over 20 years. And I'm thinking, why in the heck did I, as an advisor, not know this about all of our behavioral biases? And I thought back to 
all the bad decisions I made or I advised on behalf of my clients because I was biased and I didn't know. And so I started sharing some of these results with advisors and I started getting picked up on different speaking circuits and, uh, and people would come up to me because, you know, they're interested in behavioral finance and advisors would come up to me and say, gee, this is great, but you know, what do I do about it? And that's really where my thinking took a turn that I don't want to just educate people about behavioral finance. I want to teach them and provide turnkey solutions about what they can actually do to improve the results. Well, let's talk about that because that's the key, right? It's the it's you helping them change their behavior to change other behavior. But but Jay, there are a lot of people. I mean, you just rattled off three of the you know very 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 famous people. But there are a lot of other financial services professionals who hold themselves out as being you know very tuned in with with just overall behavior with clients. What makes your approach different? Yeah, right on. It's so, and part of this is very personal to me too, because when I was starting to study this stuff out, I would go and I would listen to these other experts in the field. And they're all, gen- I mean, I haven't heard a bad behavioral finance speaker ever. And I oh. think that's because the topic is so awesome. But even somebody dry can do a pretty good job. But I would leave there wondering, well, what the heck do I do about this? You know, so, so you've empowered me to identify maybe a few biases, to define a few biases. But how do I actually like incorporate that in my practice? And I am a big believer that knowledge is worthless if we don't know how to use it. And how many advisors go to these conferences for, you know, the two to three day conferences and they come around with pages and pages of notes. They love it. They feel great about it. And then they implement next to nothing in their business. Number one, because they're inundated with ideas. They don't know which one to pick. It's kind of the paradox of choice. I've got all these choices to improve my business. They're all great. And then they also come back and they're like, oh, and then I'm still busy like eight to five every day. So how am I going to integrate this into my practice? So over the last five, six years, I've really been refining how I can create the content, the ideas, everything for the advisor So that way they can actually implement this in their business. And that's what sets me apart from everybody else that speaks on this topic. When I go and speak at industry uh, conferences, I say the same thing everybody else does. You know, it's 50 minutes long on average. Sometimes it's an hour and a half. And, but I guarantee them that they'll put, they'll be able to pick one thing and put it in their practice right away. And I make sure it's very, very easy. Unfortunately, only a couple percent actually do it. Some people, you know, aren't that interested in it. Other people are interested, but they have competing priorities. And then there's the few percent that the time is right for them. And those are the people that I'll usually connect with. And there's a significant value proposition on my end to the advisor, and then therefore on the advisor end to their client. You have talked about anchoring before, so that's something I've heard of. And uh, as an ex-therapist, we used to talk about it in something called neuro-linguistic programming. You use this principle, and this is one of the things that you do in your speeches. Talk to our audience about what is that? How does this stuff work? Because this is a behavioral principle in itself. Yeah, that's right. It's interesting how you said you've heard of anchoring in in other ways. And one thing that I found is really fun fun with uh, behavioral finance. Now, these are all psychological concepts, right? This is psychology that for years and years has been applied in other parts of our life, but not in the financial part. A few years ago, I was speaking on behalf of Charles Schwab. They hired me to do, I don't know, it's like 150 events across the nation in one year. I was very, very busy with them. Many times, I because I, I went out and I spoke to their clients about behavioral finance, many times I would have a neuroscientist or psychologist or psychiatrist come out up to me afterwards to talk. And I think, oh no, what did I say wrong? Right? Because I'm like, those people are the experts. And oftentimes I would hear them say, that was really good. I've never thought about how something like anchoring could be applied in the financial aspect. So they respected the field. And even though they're experts in the field, much more than I am, they still didn't see how it is applied in the finance field. And this is how advisors can be really powerful with this. You don't have to be as smart as a psychologist. You just have to know some of these basic, most important and most common biases, understand how they influence us, 
and then what to do about it. So when it comes to anchoring, all right, in the financial realm, here basically anchoring is whenever we 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 anchor to a number. We don't know the answer, and so the mind needs to guess somewhere. It's a reference point, right? So you know, if you don't know how many miles the Earth is to the Sun, you got to make an initial guess. And you could influence that initial guess by throwing out a number and subconsciously my mind may anchor to that. Now, that's fine and dandy in the psychological world. In our world, here's what's important to understand about anchoring. We anchor to past performance and expected future return. And what that means is we expect those results. And when we make adjustments, the adjustments tend to be very small. So I have a question that I have developed for advisors that I work with. These are members of the Behavioral Finance Network in order to identify and to blast that anchoring bias away. Here's what it is. It's a simple question. It's, it's written. I have them actually write this out and give it to the client. We state that the market has averaged over 8% return per year historically. And then we, I ask for, give me a range of returns you expect the market will return in the next 12 months. Now, what happens in this question is that the person taking the question sees two numbers. They see the numbers 8 and 12. Now, the 8 is 8%, but the 12 is 12 months. What's interesting about anchoring is it does not matter whether the number has to do with the question at hand. It is simply the number. So subconsciously, investors are being anchored to the 8 and 12. They don't know about it, and then they will adjust from there. When I did, when I performed this question or I was testing it with both financial advisors answering it as well as investors, by and large, almost all responses came back between 3 and 6%. Now, it really doesn't matter what your clients answer there. What matters, well, it does, but what really matters is, is there a negative? And you almost never see a negative in there. Yet, if you tell the client, Mr. and Mrs. Client, you do know that markets will go up and down and that you will lose money at some point, they'll nod their head in agreement and say, yeah, well, of course I know that. You give them this question and they'll give you two positive responses, which means that yes, they recognize it's possible, but they really don't think it's going to happen now. And now is what's most important. So if you have a client that answers this question with two positive numbers, we then turn it around and we make it a coaching session for them. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Client, are you 100% sure that the market's not going to be negative? in the next 12 months? And well, no, no, I guess it could go down. Well, then why didn't you put a negative response here as one of them? I just simply asked for a range of returns, not what you hope it will return. And usually the answer there is, oh, so we're now starting to break down that bias there. And then, and then you re-ask the question. So realistically, what's the range of returns that you expect? And now we'll see a negative And all we want to do is make sure that the negative we see is commensurate with the risk in the portfolio. If they have a moderately aggressive portfolio, let's say 70, 80% in equities, and they put negative five to plus 50, okay, great, we got the negative, but that's not commensurate. We want to see something like negative 30 to plus 50, something like that. But it gives us that question right there allows us to then coach our client, break through that bias and help recalibrate their expectations to something that's more realistic. Oftentimes, what happens with investors is we, because we're subconsciously anchoring to 8% and nobody has taught us to focus on the range of returns, right? Because as advisors, we're saying, hey, over time, you're going to average 8%. Or with your financial plan, we expect you to get 6.2% you know, each year annualized, and that'll help us get to your return. But we never define what the range of returns we're likely to experience. So now that you know that they're going to anchor to both past performance and future expected return, that's fine. But we need to offset that with teaching them the range of returns. Hey, this is going to get 6% over the long term. 
But you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Client? In the short term, we ought to expect returns anywhere between negative 30 and plus 50. Hmm. So because they anchor, you give them the correct anchor. Hmm. And that's behavioral coaching right there. Now, you keep using the word coaching, which is obviously something that you teach people in the Behavioral Finance Network. But I want to get back to setting those anchors. So I'm sure that it won't surprise our listeners that there are a lot of uh, financial advising coaches out there, much like what I used to do many, many, many years ago. And I would talk about content. Look, guys, you have to be sending out content. But what I had found was the majority of the content, Jade, that they sent out was actually increasing their bias towards those larger numbers because they were so number focused. What you, What is your take on that? I mean, how are advisors communicating effectively and ineffectively on this? Well, you hit a you hit a hot spot with me. So, con, you know, if you talk to any financial advisor coach out there, you know, they all do their business a little bit different, but there seems to be a lot of agreement in that advisors need to uh, create and and have better content, more consistent content for their clients. And the, the, the problem we have today is the content out there, frankly, is pure crap. You know, if you think think about the content, I mean, the average advisor will send out maybe a market report, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I got to send out content. All right, here, my, uh, you know, this research firm just put out this market development report or what have you. And so you, you email out, out to clients. And then I ask these advisors, I'm like, so do you want the, your clients to watch the market or not watch the market? And they'll say, no, I don't want them to watch the market. Well, then why the heck are you sending them economic updates about what's happening right now? Because that has a shelf life of about a day or two, maybe shorter. So what we're doing is oftentimes the very content that we're trying to send out to our clients, as you mentioned, it might actually fuel the biases, not just because it's rational and numbers based, but because it gets them to focus on short term rather than long term decision making process. You see, a good investor is all about a good decision making process. It's not about hitting the right stock. Right. I mean, unless you are an early investor in Netflix or one of those, right? But for, for all intents and purposes, it's really about the decision making process. So that's bad content. Another example of bad content, in my opinion, is good content that's not relevant or timely. So MIT's Age Lab, Age, A G E Lab, actually did some research on what is the best way to communicate with other people, like what grabs their attention? How do you grab it and retain it? And they found that uh, messages need to be brief. They need to be smart, right? Kind of engaging the intellectual mind and they need to be fun, right? So those are the three things they said. And I would add one more thing to that based upon my experience and that's it needs to be timely. So many advisors, what they'll do because they don't have time to create their own content often is that they will just grab a market, you know, subscribe to a marketing library or sometimes these website providers that advisors use, you know, they'll have their own stuff and the content is very well presented. Sometimes they have some great videos, but the problem is there's no timeliness to it. You know, I may be interested in say cancer, but I'm not going to spend two hours out of my day to research cancer. Now, if my wife calls me up and says, I just found a lump and I went to the doctors and he says it's cancerous, you, I'm going to clear my schedule and spend hours studying it, right? So it needs to be personal. It needs to be timely. So that is what's going to attract and engage people. That's what we learned from the science of it. So where do advisors get this stuff? And that's the problem. Most advisors don't have time to create their own unique content And so that's one of the solutions that I provide in the Behavioral Finance Network is I create content for these individuals each month, a ghostwritten ghostwritten piece as well as a video. I create it. It's for network members only. It doesn't compete anywhere else out there. And so in those instances, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to solve the problems we all know are out there. And all of my stuff is behavior-based. And it's based upon, I use examples of the day. For example, uh, I just released a video to, uh, in, in March, March 1st here to my network members, a very short video that they are embedding on their websites for their clients to see that has to do with the fact that it's called February fluctuations. The fact that in January, the whole talk of the media was 
fear of missing out, right? It was the great melt up. And then all of a sudden now it's the fear of being in and the amount of volatility we found in the markets. And then I pivoted to what can we do to mentally prepare ourselves for greater volatility going forward? And all of this is done in about 90 seconds or less. So it, it takes something that's happened real recently that people can relate to, but the principle taught behind it is timeless because human behavior for the most part doesn't change. So it's kind of teaching the same concepts over and over, but it's using the stories of the day because that's what will get people's attention. Well, you're preaching to the choir on a lot of that stuff, Jay, because obviously from a marketing and branding perspective, which is what we do, we know how important engaging content is, right? And, um, and I love the fact that you provide good content that has many deep layers to it. So I'm sure if Jay spent the time, which we don't have time on this podcast, but deconstructed the reasons why he says the things that he says in these videos and also in the writing, there's a lot of stuff underneath the surface here because, you know, a lot of behavioral changing happens underneath the surface. But with that, though, so you just really teed me up for some good stuff here, brother. I really appreciate it. So uh, how do people engage you? So they've heard you and they're like, OK, this Jay guy sounds awesome. I'm totally fascinated with behavioral finance. I want to be part of this behavioral finance network. One, tell a little bit more about what you do in that network. And then two, let's uh, let's just give them an opportunity to find out how they can sign up or what's the best way to contact you. Help me with that. Yeah. Okay. So, so the behavioral finance network really, and and this thing came out by accident as well. I started at first, I started creating tools and I'd let people buy them or subscribe to them. And advisors kept coming back to me and say, you know, you really ought to coach us because you're providing this stuff, but we need help actually knowing how to implement it. And so that's where I learned, okay, you got to make this stuff easy. So I used to have several different ways that people could engage with me. But that created a paradox of choice. Too many choice, it's like deer in headlights. So there's only one way people can connect with me. You got to be a member of the Behavioral Finance Network. And that's a network of advisors. Some are broker-dealer advisors, and there's a lot of RIAs as well. And, um, And these people will get access to my content. They get access to several proprietary behavioral tools that I've created, I do coaching webinars once a month. There's a couple of coaching calls to to help them, individual coaching calls, to help them really integrate this into their practice. And there's a threefold mission to the Behavioral Finance Network that I tell advisors right up front, this is what you can expect to get out of it. Number one, you are absolutely going to differentiate yourself from everybody else, and you don't even have to say it. Too many advisors will have on their website, we're different, or find out how we're different. Look, if you got to explain how you're different, you're not different enough, right? We don't, we don't say it, we just show it. So you're going to differentiate yourself from the very first contact. And by the way, the first contact happens before they even meet you oftentimes. So if a client is referring you, the first thing your client's referral ought to do is go to your website. So with new network members, I spend time on their website. What does it look like and what words do you have on it? How are you messaging it? Understand that your homepage to your website is the single biggest piece of real estate you have and the majority of advisors absolutely waste that space with a beautiful picture. Look, you can have a beautiful picture up there, but you better have some keywords, some ways to differentiate yourself and to engage them because asking somebody to scroll and click is asking them to do business with you in a sense. So we want to make it easy for them to want to scroll and click. We differentiate you right from the get-go on your website, through your value statement, and through the different words that you use. Words are very important. That's number one. Number two is it's going to help you connect more with clients. Because you are going to understand behavior more, uh, you're going to understand how to communicate more effectively with each type of client. For example, one of the tools I have is called Speaking Your Client's Language, five question assessment. That's it, five questions. Takes no more than three minutes to fill out and it will tell you what your client's leading communication preference is. And then you go to a quick report on it and it's like, oh, okay, this is how I want to adjust my communication. So for all those clients where you like them and they like you, but you just don't feel like you're getting each other, 
this will make sure that you get it. So to help you deepen client relationships, and then also, of course, the, the essence to behavioral coaching, help your clients make better decisions. And a, a side note of that or side benefit is help them have a better investment experience. It's one thing to talk a client off a ledge. This is all about making sure your clients don't get to the ledge to begin with. Because if every time you're communicating with them, you're sweating and you're talking them off the ledge and then you hang up the phone and you pat yourself on the back and said, I did it again. Guess what? They're not ha- your clients aren't having a great experience. Your job is to make sure they don't get to the ledge. And that's done by being proactive with this. Oh my gosh, proactive. Well, what do I say? Guess what? I've got it all for you. So it's a turnkey situation where we, we work together. We, we figure out what's best for your business. Where can you leverage it the most? I help you customize things for your business, meaning I adjust my tools to you, not vice versa. We fit into your practice. And then it's about having consistent communication. And that's why I put out two pieces of content every month. And the, these pieces of content are unique to network members. By the way, people will say, well, gosh, I, you know, how many network members are you going to have? Because then it's not so unique anymore. There will be 200 subscriptions only to the Behavioral Finance Network. When I'm done, I'm done. Because I want to, number one, I only want advisors that are serious about this stuff. I'm not interested in the advisors that just have a passing interest. If you do, grab one idea, implement it, great. These are the people right now listening to say, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I'm missing. And once we get this set up, I tell advisors, it only takes about 45 minutes per month to get maximum value out of the behavioral finance network. So with only 200, you're not going to be competing on content. You're really not going to be competing across the board. And that's the essence of this for me. I want 200 advisors slash firms that are going to actually implement this stuff rather than have a thousand people subscribe and who knows how many are actually implementing it. So that's a little bit about what advisors can expect if they were to join up on the network. And the best way, so on your website, you can even schedule an appointment with you, right? So why don't you give everybody the website? Yeah. So the website is the emotionalinvestor.org. .org. People ask me, well, what is it? Is it a nonprofit? No, nope, I'm absolutely for profit. The emotionalinvestor.com was taken, bottom line. Mm. So uh, now they want thousands of dollars for it. No thanks. Emotionalinvestor.org. And then the menu bar at the top, very clear, it'll say the Behavioral Finance Network. Mm-hmm. Click there. You'll get to see all of the different tools that are available for network members. I listed all out, complete transparency up front. Uh, there's buttons to click to schedule a call with me. And you can also sign up for a light version of the Behavioral Finance Network for free for three months. Hmm. There's no credit card needed. All you got to do is send me an email, which you can do through my website, and say, hey, I want to take the three-month trial. And so what you'll do is you'll get some content from me. You'll be invited to the coaching webinars. You won't get access to the tools or the more premier stuff, but it's a great way to find out whether you even find value in this. And then after three months, you have a choice. You either sign up or you don't. No harm, no foul. I am looking for the right advisors just as advisors are looking for the right partner to add more value to their business. And if it works for us both, great. If not, no problem. So that's the best way to connect with me. For people that want to join up to the Behavioral Finance Network, it starts at two, right now, the current pricing is $249 a month for the first advisor and a 12 month initial term, then it's month to month. If you can't commit to 12 months, I'm not interested because this will take time to get it going in, in your business. And I want to make sure you don't give up after a few months. And, uh, but again, you can try it for free for three months, as the network gets more and more people engaged in it, and as we get closer to the 200, those prices will go up for new signups. But once you're in, your price won't go up. So the emotionalinvestor.org, the Behavioral Finance Network will tell you everything you need to know. And with that, Jay, thank you very much for your thought leadership today. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you and be on your podcast. Well, we really loved having you 
couple of great nuggets there, everybody, is one, you have to communicate in a different way to your clients. Number two, you have to have something that separates you and makes you truly unique and different. And if you've been listening to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast, that is something that should be drilled into your head. I actually didn't even know Jay was going to talk about that today, but it seems when we bring guests on, expert guests, they are saying the same thing. You need to be involved with something that is going to separate you from the advisor down the street. And if you can get something that's custom, that's tailored, and that is something that is truly a different message, you're going to stand out from everybody else. So we just had Jay Moreland on with episode number 63. He is a behavioral coach, the founder of The Emotional Investor, and the founder of the Behavioral Finance Network. For all of us here at Top Advisor Marketing, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you take a moment to subscribe below, share this with all your advisor friends and family, and we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Are you ready to change the way you communicate with your clients? Are you tired of being the best kept secret in your area? Learn how to become a prolific online influencer, attract more ideal clients, and grow your business. Contact us today and see what the power of podcasting can do for your business. Click on the Contact Us link on our website at topadvisormarketing.com and set up a call to learn more. Follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook for more updates and information.